Is that what we're looking for? Yes. All right. <clears throat> So I think Dr. Rucker is supposed to start, <laughs> or Nanette, do you want to start? Um, so Dr. Rucker had sent greetings. Um, this was a project that was initiated about 18 months ago by the Board of Regents and the staff. Uh, we sent out a survey uh, asking section editors and section chairs how they felt about their newsletter and if they needed some more support. And overwhelmingly, the answer was yes, we absolutely need more help and support with this. So the staff and the communications committee, along with Nanette Elster, our communications director, and Matthew Sheriff, um, who does our graphic design for us, uh, we got together, put our heads together, and got this uh, newsletter workshop uh, put together for you. And it will be, it's being recorded and it will be posted and pushed out to the sections, uh, hopefully later today, but if not next week, we'll have a follow-on session and hope to continue the communication with our editors and our section leaders. Um, Matthew, you wanna go ahead and advance? We have a collage of some of our high-flying newsletters from recent years um, from all over the country. We have some wonderful newsletters and some great newsletter editors and writers uh, that are ready to help anybody who needs the help and wants it. Uh, peer editing is often the best kind of editing. These are some of our winners from recent years. All right, Nanette. Thank you, Susan and Dr. Rucker, because I know those were Dr. Rucker's remarks. Um, it is a little bit of a balancing act when working on a newsletter. So newsletter, you know, if you take a look at the publications that ACD has, there's kind of the most formal, which is the, the electronic journal, followed by the, the college newsletter, and then the section newsletters. So what's nice about this is it allows to be a little more personalized. Um, the, the value of the section newsletters is really being able to highlight some of the local talent. The folks who know each other can you know, pat each other on the back, share their good news, their successes. And we can do that on a grand scale in the ACD newsletter and even highlight someone or two in the journal. But this is really a, a chance to um, share amongst yourselves the successes. And so it, it really bridges that professional and personal to create a little bit of a balance. It's also not just about the news and updating, but a call to action. And the reason the section newsletters are so important here is just like everything on the localized level, sometimes you will note things or have issues that arise that may not have trickled out into a broader community or even at a national level. So it allows a call to action within your locality. And then it's also balancing the individuals, the sections, the regency, and the national organization. So once Matthew and Susan spend a little time talking about things um, from their end, you'll see a thread that weaves through. So there's a certain amount of consistency and things that get highlighted in the journal, in the ACD newsletter, and then in the sections will mirror one another and maybe look at things from, a, from the macrocosmic view to the microcosmic view. Um, and so that's what this balancing act is all about. Next slide, please. So the newsletters, as most of the publications and much of the work and all of the work of ACD is mission driven to advance excellence, ethics, professionalism, and leadership. It's that three legged stool. And so much of what is being presented relates to ethics, professionalism, and or leadership. Um, they often work together, but sometimes you might highlight a certain aspect. And you want to think about how your stories and news items tell the story of the shared mission. This is the, the, the tie that binds, if you will, this mission, this small little sentence woven throughout kind of looks at things broadly. So if you were to take a look at any section newsletter, even though the content itself may be very different, the themes, the thematic approach would be very similar and would highlight this mission of the organization. 
Um, I'm going to let Susan and Matthew talk now a little bit more about the nuts and bolts about how to do this and designing to also reflect the shared vision. Um, yeah, so I started working with the college about a year ago, year and a half now. And what I wanted to touch on was consistency of everything um, that was sent out um, and give it a more modern flair and also just something more enjoyable to read. Like um, it's, if, if it doesn't look good a lot of times, you won't get into it. So, you know, it, it's really important to, at least from a graphic point of view, is to make things easy to read, um, enjoyable, enjoyable to look at. And, you know, the consistency element is, is now there that I don't think was so much so before. Um, so you take the, the information that's given to you and you sort it and you lay it out in a way that, uh, flows from cover to the back cover. So, um, I just think this, you know, like I said, you have lots of information. And if you want it to be read, uh, you need to sprinkle things about and make sure that uh, it keeps your interest. And that was one of the first things we did with the ACB News. And um, I think it looks great now. And it's, um, um, Susan could touch on like how the readership has changed and stuff like that. But it all comes back to just consistency clean aesthetic design and, you know, staying true to the brand itself. Uh, the college is a brand. It's been around over a hundred years now. So you wanna, you know, I don't know. I just, I just call it getting into the modern approach. So uh, Susan, do you have anything to add to that? I, I do. And I want to, I want to, uh make sure that we give Matthew the proper credit because when we were asking ourselves, how do we take this mission that was created so long ago and make it relevant today? How do we demonstrate that it is relevant today? And one of, when we're asking that question, one of the things that, one of the answers was we make ourselves look relevant. And so we were so glad when Matthew was able to come on board and help us streamline and modernize the way we approach visual communication, because we do communicate and listen, if you will, with our eyes when we look at things like newsletters and journals and pieces of communication. Um, when we're, when Dr. Gonzalez and I are working on the ACD news, we're looking for news items, items of interest, reminders that really demonstrate that our mission is a doing mission. It's not a passive mission. It's things that people are doing to further the mission. So we're looking for a lot of activity um, and how people are living out the mission. Part of that is reflection. So we have the news items that are doing, we have reflections from our regents where they talk about lessons learned so that we can do more and do better as we continue. Um, and then we always have, we try and have something thoughtful about how it relates to history or how it relates to other things that are going on, particularly, you know, of course, recently COVID. Uh, so it's really back to what Nanette's point about balance. When you're building out your articles and your news pieces, you really want to think about um, the types of things you are including. Um, and to and add to does that, a fantastic okay. job with that, with the journal where she brings in multimedia history, all different approaches the topic from all different uh, uh, perspectives. Um, I think too, one thing we've done that I think people have liked, I hope they seem to like them, are adding things that build camaraderie and things that allow our fellows to know the staff and the board a little bit better. So the news from the office, the uh, news about regents, so that people see uh, that there are individuals that are running the college that are responsible for the day-to-day -day, and we're not just this monolith, the college, that, that they can reach out. So I always hope that when we add those little news bits in, that people are connecting with us and feeling like we're real people and they can pick up the phone and call because, you know, they, they know us a little bit better. 
uh, the same with the SPIA and the ASB highlights. We're trying to make sure that we're broadening uh, the aperture as much as we can when we're building each, each publication. Um, to add to that, um, you got to consider social media. And uh, it's one thing to have lots of content, but you, you have to organize it in a way that keeps telling a story. And all these different facets from the journal to the news and about the staff just creates this sort of connection. And, you know, to me, the clients are the fellows. So I want to make sure they know that uh, we're thinking about them in a sense, uh, at least from my perspective, the visual perspective, uh, that I want to make it easy for them to, to understand what's going on. I mean, it's a, a long his, history, has a long history. And, um, you know, I, I think it's how you, I think that's where we are in this phase of of development, you know, we had to start with the stuff that was standard and then we're slowly moving into the digital age. And all this, if you look at the most recent journal, you start to see the numbers really start to tell a, a different story than before. So I think it's working and I, I think it's just, I always go back to consistency. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Yeah, and I just want to build on the consistency piece, Matthew, because I, I do agree with that. I think consistency leads to predictability and comfort. And, and part of what we want here is not this, this shared mission, but feeling like, oh, th this is where I belong. And so having that visual consistency also creates that feeling of belonging and builds on this sense of community. And that ties back to what Susan said about, you know, really making this personalized so someone could pick it up and just by looking at it without reading a word now oh this is act um, and then that might just say oh well that's going to spark my attention i'm going to take a look at this and it starts to humanize this entire approach so that it's not sterile in its appearance which in turn hopefully will mean it's not sterile in its content as well i couldn't have said that better myself thank you <laughs> perfect summary Nanette. now matthew since you guys are talking about consistency i think you have some things that our uh, editors can use yeah so okay. you you really have to break down the organization and know what the the assets are and sort of their history um you know it's a long storied history like i told you and you know in this in this slide i wanted to make sure everyone knew that Here's our official logos. This is how they've uh, come about. And this is, I mean, it's, it's black and white really, well, aside from the color, but, um, you know, founded in 1920, um, the hundred year came around. So I created this version to just kind of highlight that we've passed the hundred years. And then uh, this new version, cause obviously we're in year 101 now. Um, so you kind of have to drop the, the flag a little bit, but um, also this informal mark, it has a sense of classic element to it and a modern element to it. So it kind of bridges that gap between generations because uh, dentistry is, you know, I mean, it brings on new, new fellows every year or new graduates that go into the profession. So you just want to, you want to be able to talk to them. And um, I think having these, this understanding for the, for the sections is very important. Um, I've got another slide here uh, that talks about fonts. Fonts are a huge deal. Um, you know, there's universal fonts that everyone has on their computer. I work on a Mac. Uh, you guys might work on a PC, but these two fonts are universal no matter, no matter what. So you can always use these and emulate a certain style. Um, now we, you know, having so many options and fonts, and me just putting two here is is kind of is kind of funny in a way, um, because I use tons of different fonts, but you you wouldn't really notice it. Um, it it all comes back to the same structure: a clean sans serif font and a and a kind of elegant serif font. Um, so this the next slide shows how that kind of should plays together. Um, so here's two that I, I actually use for the um, our newsletter. And um, these are all available at Google fonts, uh, fonts.google.com down here. And you can download these and 
you know, get a little more creative because I would encourage creativity um, because you're in your own communities. So everyone has a little different flavor. You know, I moved to Charleston from San Francisco. It's very different here than it is in San Francisco. Um, so those styles need to, to be sort of a visual inflection of the community you're living in. So um, this is just a sample. It looks clean, it's easy to read. Another thing I would say is you don't, you don't put long lines of type. Uh, I think six inches is a good rule um, because your eye gets kind of tired as it goes along the line. So just a little thing, that's why a lot of times I do two column work. Um, and I'll show that here, let's see. But first, <laughs> let me talk about these colors. So um, knowing your color palette is a, is, is a huge advantage. It just simplifies everything because you've got a, an array of colors, a rainbow of colors, if you will. And the college needs to stay within a certain set of tones. So, you know, obviously black and grayscale is, is part of it. We've been using this golden color amidst the dark navy, which has become pretty normal for us. Um, and then there's the shades and tones of those colors. American rose and lilac are also in, in there. I haven't used lilac enough. Um, it's a tough one for me, but um, I'm, I'm, I really like how the Ontario section uh, did their newsletter with, with that tone in there. So I thought that was really cool. Um, but this is back into column. So a long, long line of type all the way across the page, you can't read that like it just, so that's where margins come into it and different column structures um, because you don't know how long an article is gonna be. So you just need to be able to know the, the rules so you can break them essentially. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't take my word for it. Um, but like, these are two very simple templates that you could do. It's a double column on one and it's a, it's a two column on the other, uh, one with a longer column and one with a shorter. Um, but this kind of illustrates that this was done in Microsoft Word. So um, good luck to those who do that. Um, I am not very good in Word design wise. So don't hold that against me, please. Um, I use InDesign, but there's other, some people might like Illustrator or PageMaker. And if, you, if there is a section that uses InDesign, then come talk to me, I can make it a lot easier for you. I can compile all this stuff uh, and give you out those assets. Um, I can also do pieces for Word, but building things in Word, uh, it's not my forte, unfortunately, but um, it can be done as you see right here. Um, so from there, we go into what do you do with the publication afterwards? So I'll let Susan talk about that. Just the boring part where you have to, uh, where you're making decisions about when to mail, when to email. Uh, we always encourage posting, but if you post it on a static website, how do people know it's there? Uh, we, as you know, mail our newsletter. We run the, uh, they call it NCOA, National Change of Address Database. We have our printer run that before they mail it for us. We also run the deceased database, which is the sad one, but they do pull from um, uh, any deceased information they have uh, nationwide and let us know who on our list has, has passed away. Um, that You can do that yourself if you're mailing your newsletters. When you ask us for an updated roster, just know that we've started running that um, every time we mail. So our database is becoming more and more accurate. So please let us help you with that. Um, if you want to email it, we can send you a list of the emails that we have. Our email list is significantly better since we uh, now have a new database where our fellows are allowed to update their own information. Uh, we also have through the database, a contact center. So we can help you with a very simple one page, three to five item mail out, or we can do a very simple, this is from editor Robin Henderson and attach your PDF to it and mail email, do an email blast to your entire section. So you do have some options here in the office with uh, some increased support from us. 
So please, uh, if please don't hesitate when you're talk, working through these issues to email me or call me and I will uh, be happy to work with you and figure out the best way to distribute your newsletter. Now, to add to that, we also use an online service called Issue for all our uh, journals and newsletters that, you know, it's a digital world now. So if you don't have the luxury of printing, then something like that might be nice to, to create your archive for your section. Um, I, I love it. I love uh, the choice we made. And um, it's pretty easy to use. So that was something I thought we would. Yeah, that's a good, I'm glad you brought that up, Matthew. It's a, it's a flip book. It turns your PDF into a flip book. And as Matthew said, it's super easy to use. That's another great thing. Instead of an attachment, you send the link to issue. And you can also embed it straight onto your website if you have one. So that, I'm so glad you remembered to bring that up, Matthew, because that has yeah. been a wonderful tool for us. And you can get a free version of it. Uh, the, the paid version is pretty cheap, but you can get a free version of it. And I think that's just keeping with the way we communicate nowadays. Um, it's expensive to print, um, but if you have a large contingency, a lot of people like reading paper. Uh, I still do. Um, so I think that's great. But, you know, if, it, if it's a smaller newsletter, then, you know, doing it digitally would the, the idea is to get it in front of people so that they can experience it. So many ways to do that. I'm sorry. The last thing I wanted to add is that everyone who is who we know of who is a section editor or chair secretary or secretary treasurer has been added to the section newsletter editor committee in member clicks in the database. So when you log on to your fellowship account and you hover over your profile, you can click committees. And some of these things that Matthew has shown today are in there. The seal, the word templates for you to use are in there. There are stock photos that we've loaded in there. There's photos of Dr. Jones and Dr. Gonzalez. I noticed those are frequent, the president and the EV photos are frequently used uh, in your newsletters. And I can continue to add whatever you all think is relevant. I think I put the Mason torch in there. Um, the uh, section newsletter rubric is in there. It's a great way, even if you have no interest in the award, it's a great way to see uh, what, what building blocks of make a great newsletter. Um, and then if you do enter for the award, the uh, cover sheet's in there. So all those are handy tools. You just have to log into your fellowship account. Let me go ahead here. Yep. Dr. Rucker, would you like to wrap this up for us? Well, I would be pleased to. And uh, apologies that uh, the gremlins of technology uh, here in Spokane area have uh, uh, have wreaked their havoc, and I was unable to be in the first 10 minutes. Um, the, um, um, the interest in newsletters I found throughout our regency, and I see two of you are from our regency, um, uh, but it's it, I've certainly heard the same echoes across the land uh, that section newsletters are, are considered so valuable for uh, rallying, uh, interest in, in section activities, uh, in intersection uh, dealing with uh, um, within regencies and beyond regencies has just become so easy. Uh, ironically, I think related to COVID uh, and people's increased facility with Zoom and with, and with electronic features. Yes, people like to have, and I like to have paper held in front of me, um, but uh, People, by and large, I think we're finding that they can print it on their very good printers and uh, can get the hard copy if they want. Uh, but otherwise, uh, certainly the 20s and 30s and 40s something folks generally are real happy to get their communications online, whether it's by social media or whether it's by uh, a PDF uh, version of, of a communication. And uh, so it's 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 been terrific. The the communications committee of the college has uh, accepted and continues to accept um, the uh, newsletters that have been hybrid printed so that there is an electronic form. And most of the hard copies actually can be submitted as PDFs. And we're still looking at them. 
Um, uh, I must say that the, uh, there's been increased attention and increased uh, uh, interest of, uh, both uh, within the college and outside for uh, electronic formats. So I, I am so pleased and impressed that we've had uh, this basic introduction to the set of tools that people can use to, uh, to allow good access to pretty simply making newsletters uh, of the collective information that they have within their regencies and beyond, uh, within their sections and beyond. Um, we had someone recently uh, uh, at one of the section meetings say, well, not much has been happening for us live in the last two years. So we don't have much in the way of photos. Other sections have said, we have stock photos. We have plenty of photos of the fellows, of, of, of activities that has been, have been done in the past and we can take them off the, uh, off the web. Uh, I just a few minutes before the meeting began, saw the, uh, the immediately new released uh, Southern California. Uh, newsletter. And it contained photos of uh, green flash sunsets from dental offices. And uh, it contained uh, some of the, uh, of the uh, greetings to uh, new fellows and congratulations to them that had been posted and were available online through the college and I suspect through Susan um, um, and others online. So it, it makes a, a terrific collection uh, of creativity. Um, and uh, as I think you saw in probably the opening slides of the, of the different covers of different newsletters, a lot of creativity has gone into it. Florida uh, newsletter, uh, it looks Florida. And, and it's uh, very interesting to see that happening. And the rallying point has been that we now more widely share across the land. So we, we see Florida's, we see New York's so when we're on the West Coast. And, and why is that important? Well, the section chiefs tell me it's really important because they're able to, to share new ideas, different ideas, structures of what other sections are doing to rally their interest, uh, to rally support for the college mission, and frankly, to understand the college mission better. Because no, despite all of our sincerity at being part of the American College, um, it is a continuum, I find, of learning, uh, of some very fine evolution of how in the 2020s we can best uh, manage to fulfill our missions, to rethink the applications of our mission for young dentists who are coming out of school and for those of us who are not so young who are at the, perhaps the other ends of our careers and also have some, some great challenges to uh, uh, perpetuating uh, and to building uh, and complementing the ethics and professionalism and leadership within this profession. So uh, bravo uh, to, uh, uh, to all of the parts of the college that have contributed to this and particular thanks to um, uh, Nanette um, as the college's communications director for, for the, uh, the overview and management and continuous uh, um, review of our content that is uh, so beautifully mission directed uh, to Matt uh, for as, as the primary graphic design contractor for helping us and, and, and agreeing to be a resource to the uh, uh, individual section newsletter editors and would be editors. We can all become editors, there's no question. And now with our close association with uh, WADJ, we have more access to more expertise that we can draw upon. and. Courtesy of the kind of communications we have, I think people are starting to draw more on them to, to allow professional editors, people who have spent a great deal of time focused on, on these issues, very happy to share their insights, both from a content standpoint and from a from a, a delivery standpoint, from a mechanical standpoint. And of course, um, and unquestionable and continuous thanks go to Susan Pittman. Thank you so much for uh, helping set this up, Susan. Open questions? Yeah, definitely. Anyone have questions? At our next one, are we gonna talk more about um, specific content, um, like guiding that? Yes, so the next session is really, a, uh, in fact, I think, Dr. Henderson, you are actually one of our mentor editors. 
So that will be what we'd like to do is start with the mentor editors to give just kind of an introduction to themselves and their newsletter. And we're going to break everyone into a small group. Uh, we're asking that the participants bring something they're actually working on or would like to work on so that you can get more specific peer to peer about how your how it's done and how it works best. Um, so yes, that we see these first two sessions is just the beginning of a, a beautiful friendship between editors across the country and in Canada. And just so um, Matt and Annette know, you're extremely successful at what you do. Um, it, it's made it easy for me to um, try to emulate like what you lead with. So that's that is how I try to do it. I really spend a lot of time um, looking at what you produce, and then I just try to. Um, do something consistent to that. So your consistency helps me immensely. Thank you. And as we're kind of getting more adept at we're do, what we're doing from the, the editorial committee, um, what I'd like to do is be able to, once we have our themes, whether they're going to happen in the order we plan them to, I can't guarantee. Um, but once we have that, I'd like to share it with our section so that if you want to build out from there, you can. If we have resources that we're collecting, we can share them with you. And so as you were talking about developing content, um, please know that it, certainly from the ethics professionalism standpoint, reach out to me at, at any time. Um, and I'm happy to share what resources I have. I have access to so many different publications and library publications that I can and help you in that regard. So I'm here for that. Don't hesitate to utilize me as a resource as well. Thank okay. you. I, I, Dr. Ecker, I'm sorry. I see Dr. Gonzalez's hand up yes. and then we'll go to you. Well, I wanted to go back and Robin, you said something that I thought was too good to miss. Uh, so, and this is a discussion that's ongoing with Nanette and Matthew and Susan. And, and Dr. Rucker, but it's important. There's much content that is universally deployable content that has to do with the annual meeting and the speakers and uh, the theme of the meeting beyond 2030. Um, and as that begins to be populated, it will appear, of course, in the ACD News. But anything appearing in the ACD News uh, can be repurposed locally. So what I'm hoping is, and, and uh, Susan mentioned going to the committee section where the logos and the style guides live, uh, and Matthew mentioned the color palette, all that is available. But some of this, what I would consider like an associated press release. So when the content for the fall meeting is executed in April of this year, prior to the spring newsletter, it, um, it should reside, or the intent is for it to reside as well in those um, in that committee group, so that if you needed that data, that data doesn't change at that level, right? Your local meeting and your, your own schedule may change, but it won't change at that level. And we just want to make sure that that content, that, that released content can be used um, however you see fit to, uh, to um, Nanette's point. And uh, the more that we can reinforce this discussion and build toward our sort of um, capstone event, which is the fall meeting, the more that we can do that, the more likely we are to sort of reinforce themes and um, produce uh, repetition in communication, but not redundancy. And that's important, I think, as we uh, reawaken from the post-COVID haze. Over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Recker, go ahead. Well, uh, I'm building on that too. I'd like to uh, uh, point out uh, a couple of items for the probably four dozen or more sections that will be uh, our section individuals who will be listening to this and to next week's session as well uh, as part of our building blocks because we have recorded them for that. And that is that from a content standpoint, I think it's an important and we haven't spoken of it that, I, that I've heard of, but there's an important reciprocal flow of news and mission content. That is to say that the sections and the regencies often have access to information that is so uh, crucially exemplary for the uh, college mission that uh, uh, not sharing those is, is, would be a sad point. And that the, uh, as it turns out, the newsletters that are published 
contain information not only that has been called from and and uh, is uh, echoed from the uh, uh, college uh, head offices and and unified fellowship, but vice versa. Of course, that was information going back in and can be uh, cycled through and 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 carried on um, uh, and disseminated throughout the college uh, by. Uh, the wisdom of, of uh, Nanette and, and, and with the, uh, uh, the talents of Matt. Uh, it's, it's great to see this happening and we have already seen this happening. We've seen this happening a lot in the last year uh, in particular and, and more, but for certainly in the last year and I'm very excited about it. You know, that being said, if there's expertise that you notice in your sections that you think needs this, this broader platform, of the journal or there's some maybe someone's doing some scholarly research some empirically based research that maybe we haven't gotten wind of yet but they're looking to move that forward and it's advancing the image please please reach out and and let's get that highlighted at every level um so i do think the reciprocal flow is absolutely necessary it shouldn't be hierarchical but instead it should just be collaborative i have a question um, and this may be obvious to you, it's not, not obvious to me, but is the information that's shared in the journal proprietary to the fellowship or uh, to Dr. Rucker's point about dissemination of information, um, is it available to uh, some of these articles or whatever you, to disseminate into the um, community dental uh, organizations at large? to raise awareness, not only of the topics, but also uh, the academy or the, uh, the college. Uh, case in point, I listened to a wonderful uh, SPIA presentation on um, how doctors became killers. And uh, it, was a, it was two hours of conversation around uh, what happened to the medical professions uh, when Hitler rose to power. And it was very. It was. It was in uh, around the time of the Holocaust anniversary, and 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 I know that there would have been, um, if if we were able to broadcast that a little earlier, there would have been a broad interest, uh, at least here in the state of Colorado and Wyoming, uh, and I'm sure that throughout the land. So so I wonder if that's ever been discussed, or does that somehow uh, allow the the non fellows. For the non-participants, kind of a freebie. Um, any comments on that? It's a great question. Maybe I should take on the administrative question. With let me ask uh, Lance and um, Annette first. So administratively, uh, and this is important. And let me ask the question. Let me answer the question you've asked. Our expressed hope, uh, as a, from a communications perspective, is that we are broadly socialized with those who are fellows of the college and those who are not. And to that end, um, Dr. Savory, one of the reasons that most of this material exists outside the firewall for membership is for precisely that point. So we want to have a, uh, a freedom of information flow that is that uh, not only meets the needs of the fellowship, but far beyond the 8,000 or so fellows that represent the community. So that's first. Um, how that's done varies greatly, but we I will say this, in the past year, uh, because we have a little tighter control over uh, the downloads and things like that, when I say control, in terms of looking at the effect from a numerical perspective, uh, I think more people are accessing this information, portions of it, they're building their own content around it, and um, that is our expressed hope. Now, one of the things Nanette has tried to get us to do, and we are getting there, although I will tell you it's somewhat glacial, uh, and, and we acknowledge that, and that is getting more and more of uh, visual learning and attention in addition to print learning, in addition to how you receive it. We want to be on the platforms where our, our constituents are, whether irrespective of fellowship, and getting there um, for people like me who are auditory learners, I need to hear it. Other people need to see it. I got all that. Every All of that is true. But I hope that in the state of Colorado and Wyoming and throughout um, and globally that our information is downloadable and deployed um, with uh, an effort toward our conscience of dentistry approach to healthcare and oral health in general. 
Thank you. So on a personal level, what I'd like to add is I use ACD material when I teach my course, Oral Health Ethics, which I'm teaching this semester. There are no dentists in my course. They're all master's or doctor level bioethics students, um, and they utilize this material. Um, I also, when we have an issue come out, I share it on LinkedIn so that my network of over a thousand people, um, most of whom are not dentists but work in public health or work in bioethics, are able to see and it gets reshared, which is really helpful. I am not a social media person at all, much to my husband's dismay. Um, but I, I do when and where I can see it is advantageous. Um, and so I think you're absolutely right. Being able to share this information broadly is something important. Right now, our, I, one of the other ways we're hoping to do this is to get the journal itself indexed. Um, it's gonna take us some time, that, that glacial pace that Dr. Gonzalez was talking about. This is a huge lift, but I'm hoping we'll get indexed on PubMed, Google Scholar, that will allow any academics, for example, or students who are searching a topic to then get hits to what is being put forth in the journal itself. And so if the journal is integrated with the section newsletters and with the um, ACD newsletter, they're then going to be able to access that as well. So it's a trickle down effect. So slow and steady is the approach we're taking right now, not trying to bite off more than we can chew, but again, really taking this team-based collaborative approach is going to help achieve those goals. So I'm so glad you raised that for us. All right, Dr. Rucker. I'm not sure. I think Dr. Jones had his hand up. I'll wait for you, Lance. Oh, I thought you were clapping, Dr. Jones. I'm sorry. I know, I know it looks like that, and I, and I like both of those. Um, just uh, to follow on, Jerry, uh, you know, you, you didn't, uh, not only brought up some great things here, but at the meeting night before last of your executive that I was kindly invited to attend um, in Denver, I, well, I guess everywhere since it was on Zoom, um, <clears throat> but you really pointed out that you have some terrific information resources, including, for example, uh, Catherine Blake's presentation uh, and the, uh, the When Doctors Become Killers presentation. Uh, and, and I think that's from outside that was brought in for uh, uh, SPIA and for uh, ACD uh, purposes. When we get wind of that, that's just a wonderful, wonderful focal point, I think, to include in your newsletters in your correspondence. I want to hear about it, certainly. <clears throat> um, and I, and I, I think that's the sort of thing that comes back through the college. So that's the, the dissemination within. But, but more to your point, I think dissemination without to the trichologist, to the profession, to the public when, uh, when it's applicable uh, is not only open to us, it's, I think, important for us as part of the mission of fellowship to understand and to do that we're derelict in our duties if we don't do that kind of communication of, of those things which illustrate the mission to do with ethics, professionalism, and leadership. And so I, I compliment you for, for where you're headed with that. Well, it, it comes from, uh, first of all, you should know, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, you can't be as physically attractive as I am and have a robust intellectual presence but um, nonetheless, I will, I will proceed. Uh, that whole program came out of the University of Colorado Bioethics uh, program uh, at Anschutz Medical Center in Denver. Uh, and they meet regularly. There was a number of uh, programs. So we're trying to interface that with the uh, uh, general dental population at large. But it also occurred to me that a program like this one with uh, how doctors became killers, if you were to approach, like for instance, the local Jewish center and allow that to be seen under the guise of sponsorship by the American College, uh, that would really broaden the awareness of the profession, in my opinion. Yeah, you, you're gonna, you, just because you're a dentist doesn't mean you're gonna touch the community, but the topic certainly would touch the community. So, you know, I have a tendency to think very expansively when I can't even organize my own clothes closet. But uh, nonetheless, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I know Mike DiOrio, 
who uh, I believe is the past president of the um, uh, dental editors uh, group, uh, lives in Denver. And so I've been arranging to try to bounce some of these ideas off of him because he's had so much interaction uh, with the national organizations, but also he was editor of the Colorado uh, Dental Journal. And uh, I think I asked Susan if there was any way that the uh, college could get a regular uh, article inside the um, uh, Colorado Dental Journal. And uh, she said, yes, there is. I just haven't done anything with that uh, to date. But I know that the editor of the journal is just really thirsty for any type of content that could go in there because it's, as you well know, it's hard to produce a newsletter or, or a, a, a magazine that comes out with valuable information. So anyway, those are just my questions. I appreciate you answering those. Thanks, Dr. Savory. Dr. Jones, I see your hand and then Annette has her hand up as well. I have three simple things. Dr. Savory, do you have an idea how we might, uh, how one might view that, how doctors became killers? Was it recorded? I can forward, I think it is. Uh, at the University of Colorado, there's a physician, uh, Dr. Winnie at W-Y-N-I-A. And I can forward you the, uh, I, I sent it out as a blast to the fellows. And uh, the, the only unfortunate part of that is that I received it a little late. I immediately sent it out, but it, there wasn't a lot of time for uh, folks to, I think we had, I mean, two or three dentists view that. So it's, Matt's a friend and colleague, so I'm happy to reach out to him. And, and, yeah. and yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that'd um, be great. So my second thing, that, what we've gone over today is really too valuable to lose. It's a, a shame that we didn't have more participants. Uh, Susan, can you review how this link would be accessible on our website? Uh, yes, I am going to send a reminder for our second session with this video attached to it to all of our section leaders. I'm going to okay. post it on, I, I would post it on dentalethics.org under resources, or I will put it under publications on our main site, maybe both for now. Um, and then I can post the link to it, just the way member clicks works. I can post a link in our section editors folder on member clicks so that people can see, you know, open the document and click the link and get to it. So and I, add as I, a comment. At its most basic, it's on YouTube. It'll be on YouTube, and then YouTube funnels it to all those different uh, channels. And yeah, as, a comment, as a comment to President Jones, uh, uh, I might uh, say that even within our regency of seven uh, sections, two are represented here. Four others have indicated to me in the past two weeks uh, after they got the word on timing of it that they really, really wanted to attend this, but they were prepared to listen to the recorded version of it uh, and catch up. Uh, it was just their practice schedules did not allow them to be part today, so. And my third and final question, I just think this is so valuable and knowing how sections work where there's a kind of an ebb and flow of activity and interest, is it possible to put a little blurb about this at the bottom of every ACD news, not taking up much space, very small font, about uh, like a link goes like to the you, video and you know headline is if you want to have your own section newspaper see this link mm -hmm. absolutely we can definitely do that thank you <clears throat> nanette go ahead I just want to backtrack, Dr. Savory, to what you were mentioning. So there, there is a lot of overlap and that outreach is incredibly important with these other entities. Um, and so I've been trying to work with organizations like the Academy for Professionalism in Healthcare, for example. They're very interested in dental professionalism right now and are looking for some collaborative efforts. The American Society for Bioethics and Humanities has a waxing and waning affinity group on oral health ethics. Um, I'm trying to reinvigorate things, but um, anybody from this organization, this group that wants to get involved, um, yes, it would require ASBH membership, um, but that's also a good way to get within that broader 
world. And so I know about the, the talk you were mentioning because Matt's very involved in ASBH and it circulated through our listserv on ASBH. So there's just a lot of intersectionality that we can build on. And I think, um, you know, this, this rallying cry to make sure that whenever we're talking about healthcare professionalism and healthcare ethics, we are including oral health in that is my kind of all the hats I wear in my day to day. That is my, my mission and goal. So you saying that was really warming my heart and you may be hearing from me, um, you said retired, which means you might have some time to get involved in this affinity group. Um, so, you know, ways that you think we can do this and the newsletters can help if there's a list of what meetings are happening when and, you know, just kind of a calendar. These are things that I can try to help circulate to everyone to make sure it gets on calendars. So for those who want to participate, they can. Thank you. I, you know, you should know that I'm a slave to interpretive dance, so that <laughs> occupies a lot of my time. Um, but uh, Lance can report this. Uh, we ended our meeting the other night with uh, uh, something that you may be aware of called the Dinner, uh, Dental Influencers Alliance. And they held a program in, I think, Scottsdale or Las Vegas. And it was, um, it reminded me of my own gestation in the profession because I if, if you all remember when Quest was around I'm a Quest doctor and uh, Neil Bray the the practice management it was his book on how to how to develop a hundred thousand dollar practice well in in this mo latest iteration uh, they're talking about this young young man from Los Angeles is talking about he's dentist to the stars and he's got a subtitle that says the one billion dollar exit strategy. And then I get another advertisement from Chris Ad, uh, which is a direct mail deal about, oh, my production. Uh, I saw like uh, 112 new patients last year. I'm now seeing 250 a month. Uh, and my gross is seven million dollars a year. Well, my Ernest Hemingway crap detector goes off when I hear that. And uh, so uh, I, think it, I think it's a challenge to try to capture um, the young person's um, um, realization that, that some of these things are just BS. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm from Wyoming, uh, so I'm monosyllabic. I don't, uh, I don't do a lot of polysyllabic terms. But anyway, it, it is alarming what's, what's trying to attract the young. And uh, I would encourage you to look at this Dental Influencers Association. It's a really quite, not, and, and by the same time, I don't want to deny my young colleagues an opportunity to participate in some of the junk that I went through in my own, you know, my own University of Bloody Shins. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Thanks, Dr. Savory. Dr. Rucker, you want to make your uh, comments and then wrap it up for us? We're right at time. Certainly, I'll certainly make the comment, a um, uh, couple that I have. And Jerry, as, as I reported to the Colorado section the other night, and we had ongoing discussions about, as we've talked about it before, the, uh, the college is certainly looking very closely at, uh, at uh, the social media communications, which are uh, pivotal for at least uh, half of the uh, membership of our profession. Um, and it's um, uh, and, and those discussions will be ongoing. The kinds of discussions that you had at your executive meeting, those sorts of things, and the very things that you've brought up here, I think are the kind of section communications that should be and could be telecast in one form or another, either directly through our, our central communication organ or um, telecast to the other corners of the college via newsletter discussions and newsletters that are logged. And I know that we're now, uh, according to discussions I've had with uh, Susan and Teresa, that we're actually going to be able to collect and log those so that you could index and look into uh, what is discussions are going on. On, on the other parts of the globe, particularly of this continent. Uh, and most important, they can look at yours if you put together that uh, a brief newsletter, even if it's just morsels of discussion of the sort that you said, and perhaps links to 
the uh, the websites or the YouTubes or whatever it is that you have that have triggered those discussions. That's so important, and I and I, I think you it's part of our mission and an important part of our mission to do exactly that. Uh, it's just wonderful to see these communications opening up and the facility to do them and the support that we have here for it. So thank you. And that's, I, Susan, I think that's my summary. I am uh, proud and pleased and impressed to see uh, the growth in the directions that this college is, is moving. Thanks to all of the, uh, the great leadership that, uh, that you and Teresa and, and uh, uh, Dick and Nat and Matt are showing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Rucker, and thanks to all of you who came and participated in the conversation. We really appreciate it. Next Friday, same time, different link. Hope everybody is registered. And uh, Dr. Henderson, I will be in touch with you and the other editors who've offered to be our uh, panelists slash mentors for next time. All right. Thanks a bunch, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. It's good Thank to you. see you, Robin. Thank you. You guys as well.